Let's hear for Dr. Irene Pepperberg. In the 1970s, when most people started studying the intelligence of animals and the communication skills of animals, they used creatures with genetic relationships to humans, such as the great apes, or they used dolphins with large brains. So when I proposed to do this kind of work with a parrot, the scientific response of my colleagues was, was rather underwhelming. My first grant proposal came back essentially asking me what I was smoking. Uh, they, were, they were horrified. I was going to do this with a creature with the brain of a shell, size of a shelled walnut? I was going to do this with a creature that's a pet? I mean, how was I going to maintain my scientific objectivity working with a pet? Well, I persevered. I sent in a grant proposal again. At this point, I had purchased the bird to be known as Alex. And we had a little bit of preliminary data. And somebody on the panel actually was studying bird song and understood the striking parallels between the ontogeny of vocal learning in humans and birds. So we got this grant for one year. Typical grant more than that. But I was ecstatic because we'd done preliminary studies. I knew we had enough stuff that I could easily turn the grant around, resubmit it, and get going for several more years. And I felt that we were on our way. Well, Alex and I were, to a certain extent, on our way. But our lives were more like the perils of Pauline than anything else. Every time something wonderful like that happened, there was a downside. But over the course of these years, Alex had learned to identify about 50 different objects. He learned to identify, what was it, seven colors, five shapes. He called them one, two, three, four, five, six cornered objects. He could identify the materials of these items. He combined these labels so he could identify, request, refuse, categorize more than 100 different things. He understood numbers up to eight. He was learning concepts, things like bigger and smaller and same and different and absence. So I could show him two things and say, what's same? And he'd say, color, shape, matter, or none, if nothing were same or different. And this was very exciting work, but it was still not getting a lot of respect from my colleagues. In fact, even my then husband, you know, he felt if you didn't, couldn't stick an electrode in the brain and get a P300, it didn't count. And for those of you who don't know what a P300 is, don't worry, because I didn't either at the time. <laughs> so, you know, again, it was, it was this wonderful stuff. Alex would do these great things, and then there was always the downside. And one of the things happened about, Alex was about 10 years old, and we had just finished the same difference study, and I was invited to the International Primatological Congress. I was the only person studying a non-primate to talk for comparative psychology. And I give this talk, and the audience is rather amazed. And one of the silverback males gets up, you know, sort of <clears throat> <laughs> And he, he, he sort of goes, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, a very, very interesting type, type of, of talk here, but, but, but um, you mean to tell me that your bird has done everything that Premax Chimps has done? And I wanted to say, yeah, and backwards and in heels. Um, <laughs> But I, but I smiled and I said, yes, sir, and he sat down. And I'm thinking, I should be dancing in the streets. I mean, this was an amazing justification of our work. But a couple of weeks before, I had gotten a little letter from NSF, National Science Foundation, saying, gee, you know, we ran out of money, so your grant was approved but not funded. And so here I am at this wonderful apex scientifically, going back home thinking, nah, how am I going to keep the lab going? How am I going to support this work? It was a very difficult time of, of balancing these kinds of things. And all through this, again, there was also the tension of keeping Alex not as a pet, but as a colleague. And I have to say that, that you know, eventually when my husband and I did divorce, his attitude was, you know, well, you take the, you know, I'll take the dog and you take the bird. And, and I was furious at this. Um, because it was, it was, again, it was saying that Alex was nothing but a pet, but he wasn't. He was my, you know, he's my scientific colleague. He was my research subject, but he was my colleague. And I cared about him the way you would care about a colleague. The way, you know, I treated my students. You care about them, but you have a barrier. You keep a barrier to keep your scientific objectivity. It's, you treat them differently than you treat your child or your spouse, but you care about them. 
Now, this was not to say that Alex treated me like a colleague, okay? It was a very, he had a very different relationship with me in that he basically knew exactly what buttons to press. So he was about, remember he was about 15 years old, and we, all this time we'd been doing a lot of press work. We were trying to get people interested in the work, understand the science, and I had done Discovery Channel and National Geographic vi television shows and Scientific American Frontiers, you know, all these kinds of things. And we get an invitation to do a radio thing for the BBC. And I'm thinking, radio? I can show this bird anything? He could say anything? You know, who would know what's going on here? But I think, all right, you know, that's what they want. We'll do a taping. So I start this show by saying, okay, I've got this orange square piece of wood, and I'm going to ask Alex some questions about it. And then you hear my heels clickety click, 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 and I go into the room with Alex. And I say, okay, Alex, I'm going to ask you some questions. And I go, Alex, what color? And this little birdie voice goes, no, you tell me, what shape? So I go, okay, Alex, it's four corner. And can you tell me what color? What matter? Um, Alex, it's wood. Can you tell me what, what color? How many? Well, there, there's one toy here. And part of my brain is going, this is cool, because he's, he's not responding like a little automaton. He's interacting with me. But the other part of me is going, uh, you know, we got to show him that he really can answer the questions I'm asking him. So I go, Alex, come on now, you know, tell me what color. And he says, no, what shape? And I say, okay, I've had it. I'm going to go away. And going to give him a little time out. And you hear my heels again, click, click, clicking on the floor. And then from the room, you get this little birdie voice, I'm sorry, come here. <laughs> Orange. <laughs> and, and Alex, you know, he kept doing these things. About five years later, I was at the Media Lab at MIT. It's a wonderful, exciting scientific place. It's basically supported by sponsors who don't give a lot of money each year. And then twice a year, they come back to see what we've done with all this money. And I was working on animal-human computer interfaces, a lot of really cool stuff for them, but they wanted to just see Alex. And here are these, I mean, the CEOs, COOs of all the top companies coming in, they come in waves, five minutes at a time. And this particular group wanted to see our phoneme work, which was basically headed towards, but not yet there, of seeing if Alex could sound out words and things like that. But at this stage, it was just refrigerator letters. What you have, your little, your, your, you know, little child, okay? all the different colored plastic letters, and you'd point to it and go, what sound, you know, what sound? We did it slightly differently for Alex. So we had a tray, and we had all these different colored letters scattered around, and we'd say, what color s or what sound is blue? Okay, and we'd ask him to answer. So we set this up, and you know, we go, Alex, what sound is blue? And he goes, s, and I go, good birdie. And he says, want a nut, because he could ask for anything he wants as a reward. And I'm going, no, 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 no. We can't have these people standing around while you eat nuts. You know, let's do a couple of more trials. So I ask, you know, what sound is green? Shh, good birdie, want a nut? Well, wait. Yeah. And we do this several times, and each time he's more and more agitated, going, you know, want a nut? You know, really? I mean, and I can showing this. And finally, after about the sixth or seventh one of these, he looks at me and he puffs up his little birdiness, and he goes, want nut? N a t. <laughs> so, so this is as though, you know, he's telling you, hey, stupid, do I have to spell it for you? Yeah. But, but the cool thing about it is, okay, he was, he was literally light years ahead of us because N and T, the N and the T were on the tray and trained. The U was not. So he had figured out how to parse this word and put that N in it by himself. And this was the kind of thing that he was really, really good at doing to get us, you know, completely off the wall in terms of what his capabilities were. But again, at the time that he was doing this wonder, wonderful stuff, other things were falling apart. The media gig, lab gig fell apart. Um, I ended up on unemployment. Um, I had no way of figuring out how to keep the lab going. I started spending every other weekend at bird clubs around the country flying wherever, you know, they would put on a fundraiser for me, literally hat in hand, passing the hat around, you know, groups like this saying, hey, you know, give us money, we need to raise $100,000 a year to keep the lab going. It was not a good time in my life. And finally, my colleagues and, and friends at Harvard said, hey, you know, why don't we put in a grant proposal to see 
about their vision, how parrots see the world literally. Let's do optical illusions. I said, cool, you know, whatever. It sounds like fun. So we put in a grant, of course. It was rejected the first time. We, we counted the problems. We resubmitted it. In September 1st, 2007, we're told that we are going to get money for a year. Again, one year. But just, you know, I'm thinking, history, yay, we did this last time. You know, we, we had already done a bunch of preliminary studies. We knew we had enough to turn the grant around again, put it in in January, get the funding. I was ecstatic. Things were turning around. You know, we, it was going to come together. And a little bit later that week, I'm sitting at my desk in the morning. I have breakfast at my desk because I have to do email that's coming in from Europe and from Japan at various times. And there's an email I talk. And it meant that a huge European consortium, millions of euros, to use animals and young children as models for intelligent learning systems. So again, this was incredible justification because they were using our work as a model. I would be a consultant. I wouldn't get paid, but I get a free trip to Europe every year. And, and again, it was a justification that our work was meaningful, that the scientific community was finally getting it, okay? That, that this was good science. And I was absolutely thrilled. I get up for a second cup of coffee as this reward for myself. And I sit back down at the computer, and there's another one that's come up, another email that's come up in the interim with a little tag saying sad news from the vet at Brandeis where the birds were. At this time I had three birds, Alex, Griffin, and Arthur. And I didn't think much about it. Um, you know, it could have been one of the technicians, there was a problem in the family, sickness, and we were gonna collect some money for flowers or something. Things like that happen all the time. So then I open up the email, and it wasn't exactly about a technician, except that a technician had found a dead parrot in the back left-hand corner of the room. And my first reaction was, okay, it's a horrible mistake, this can't be. And then I'm like, oh, no, no, there's only one parrot lap. And I do go into a sort of a shock. I call up, I'm thinking, as much as I love Griffin and Arthur, it, it can't be Alex, but it is. And I can't remember how I got dressed. I don't remember how I drove the 30 miles of, of you know, freeway traffic to get into lab. All I remember is that I did beat my lab manager so that Arlene wouldn't have to walk into this herself. The veterinarian had wrapped Alex's body for us so we could take it to our private vet for an autopsy. I remember sitting in the, the grieving room saying our final goodbyes, but I was in shock. We had, this was happened on a Friday. We had only, I had only called a couple of close friends to tell them this. A couple of people came in to, to be with me that weekend. They, they made sure I was fed. They took care of me. And I was still in complete shock. And over the weekend, my board of directors put up an obituary because I couldn't even do that. Monday morning, I call Brandeis and I say, you know, we've got an obituary for their PR people to, to let out. And my friend Laura at the, the office there says, well, I'll run it, but I don't think it's going to have much traction. I mean, you know, it's a bird. So I say, whatever. In the 40 minutes it took me to get into the lab, my cell phone starts running off the hook. Her, my lab manager's cell phone is running off the hook. Lab man the lab phone's ringing off the hook. I, interviews all over. People are calling. It's crazy. For every thing, call we answer, there's, there's two more call waiting. And I snap into interview mode. I've done this for years. Every time Alex did anything exciting, it was interviews. So I just, yep, you know, you close your eyes, you hold on to the phone, you answer the questions, and you just do it. And I did that for several days. And the emails were pouring in, and the letters were pouring in. And I, I wasn't processing anything yet. I was in total shock. And then somewhere towards the end of the week, we get this big box of letters from a grade school. And one of the letters was from a young boy, and he says, I know how you feel. My grandma died this summer. Your heart will heal. And all of a sudden, it hit me what had happened. And that, that barrier that I had put between myself and Alex for my scientific objectivity, there wasn't going to be any more science. And that just completely crumbled. And I realized I had lost the most important being in my life for the last 30 years. Irene Pepperberg. <laughs>